Um, yeah, so we will all have to make sure that we speak well into our microphones. You'll seem a long way off. So welcome to this meeting of the Health and Wellbeing Board um, on this very windy and wet afternoon. So well done, all of you who, who, who actually made it here. Um, I had some parking issues myself, which was why we're starting a few moments late. So I apologize for that. Um, but for, I welcome all the members, all the officers and the public um, to this board. We do have some members of the public here, uh, which I'm pleased to see. And um, hopefully there are members of the public who are listening to this um, on the webcast. And it's important that you're all aware that this meeting will be webcast, that a record will be retained on the council website for up to two years. And by participating in this meeting, you are consenting for your name, the content of what you say, and your image to be broadcast and stored to the council website. So if any of you have any problems with that, please do get in touch with our committee services here um, straight away. And if, for those of you at home who are looking at this webcast, if you look above the video, you'll see a, a tab marked resources. And if you select this, you'll get a link to the agenda and that makes it easier for you to follow the meeting because you'll be able to read all of the reports. Um, please remember that you do have to turn your microphone on when you speak, um, otherwise the, the cameras won't, uh, won't capture you on the webcast and your lovely faces won't be broadcast to the public. We'd hate to miss that. Um, but please turn your microphones off when you're not speaking. I'm one of the worst offenders for forgetting that. And you end up with feedback. So, um, so please, um, please make sure that you do that. Um, so if we have any of our new co-opted members who are present, I'm not sure if they are, Sue, Sue Higginson, um, no, I can't see any of our, that's fine. So in that case, can I ask if any of you have any Disclosable pecuniary interests in connection with any of these items on the agenda. And if you do, please, can you declare those interests? Hmm. Councillor Gilchrist. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Just seeing some guidance, because you mentioned uh, the various kinds of interests. But I just want to ask Vicky Shaw for you, Chair, for advice. Agenda item 11 talks about the pooled fund and talks about the role of the Adult Social Care and Public Health Committee, which we're both members of. Your chair, but I'm wondering if we're caught in some way because we'd be voting on something twice, wearing one hat in one place and one in another. But if Miss Shaw says that's just part part of life, I'll accept her advice. Thank you, chair. Thank you, chair. Thank you, Councillor Gilchrist. No, it's quite acceptable for you to be present in both meetings. Um, we've got apologies for absence from Simon Banks, Liz Bishop, Sue Higginson, Martin Earl, David Henshaw, Michael Brown, Karen Howell, Janelle Holmes, Karen Pryor, Abel Adagoki, and Councillor Jeanette Williamson and Alan Evans. Uh, Tony Bennett is here as a substitute for Karen Howell. Thank you very much for that, Tony, and welcome. And Matthew Swambra is in attendance as a substitute for Janelle. So, thank you, Matthew. Um, right. So any of you, any of those of you who are here for the meeting on the 20th of July, gosh, was it that long ago? Um, is, it, is everybody happy with the accuracy of the minutes? Can I have a mover for that, please? Councillor Anderson, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cowan, seconded. Um, we have had, I have not, well, that's not true. That public questions and statements, we did receive um, some public questions, but they, they were not within the scope um, of this board, and uh, it will be dealt with in other places other committees. Um, so that moves us on to item five, the formation of the Community Voluntary and Faith 
sector reference group. So we have Kevin Sutton from the CVF group. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you so much. Um, and just take us through the report, Kevin, please. Uh, I'm not, thank you, Chair. I'm not proposing to, to go through the report. Is, as a member of the CVF reference group uh, in respect of community, I'd just like to uh, give you the view from a community perspective in respect of what we're trying to achieve uh, through, this, through this report. Um, the voluntary community, faith and social uh, enterprise partners are a vital cornerstone of a progressive health and care system. The inter integrated care packages should ensure that government and decision-making arrangements support close working with the sector as a partner in shaping, improving and delivering services and developing delivering plans to tackle the wider determinants of health. The sector partnership should be embedded as an essential part of how the, si how the system operates at all levels, not just through this board, but across the public sector and the council in general. The effective involvement and representation of communities' achievements and interests are a vital part of empowering communities to become a partner and participants in public planning and decision-making processes across Wirral and the Merseyside region, uh, particularly now and in the future. Um, it is critical that representatives are visible and identifiable by communities and the CVF sector rather than selected directly by an organisation or public sector body or partnership, as has been the case in the past. This needs to change. We also need a localised and bottom-up way of strengthening communities through recognising, identifying and harnessing existing community assets, i.e. things like skills, knowledge, capacity, resources, experience and enthusiasm that individuals and communities have which can help to strengthen and improve things lo locally. This has been highlighted through the development of the humanitarian cell and the uh, work that, that's come on through that and the recognition of what a, ro what a vital role the CVF sector and social enterprises actually pay, play in, in our communities. Uh, it is recognised that we are swamped by a myriad of services, council and CVF services, and organisations both individually and collectively, and that communities can offer emotional and practical support, but only limited specialised services and resources. Hopefully we can find a way together to work out how we can invest in community development and identify actions with relevant outputs and, uh, and outcomes. Currently, processes to involve and identify representation of local communities are limited with little or no transparency on who is speaking on behalf of communities across the development and delivery of all public services. There is extensive knowledge, experience and expertise at a local level and a recognition of how services and quality of life can be improved in specific neighbourhoods and across the borough. A community-based approach needs to be considered in the form of developing and supporting community forums and hubs not dictated to by ward and neighbourhood boundaries or public service organisations or individuals. We know that there will always be people who need, to support, who need support from outside their community, but we also know that communities work best when professionals who provide the support work alongside local people. We all have a collective responsibility going forward to change the way we work and to change the way we deliver uh, public services. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Kevin. I can disentangle myself from this. Um, yes, thank you very much for that. Um, you're absolutely right um, in what you say about the importance of how we work and changing how we work, but also ensuring that we do involve the sector um, in the work that we do going forward. And that's what, exactly why um, this board asked for this reference group to be developed, and I'm pleased to see that it's, it's there and that it's happening and that we do now have a reference group. Um, 
and I would like to thank very much um, all of those people who have worked on it, um, Community Voice who pulled it together, and everyone who's been prepared to give up their time uh, to be a part of it and to take part in it. And I know linking it into the report that follows this, again, about broader picture about how the whole of the local authority and our health partners work with the voluntary sector going forward. All of this needs to come together um, and we need to have input into here from as wide a range of voluntary sector groups as we possibly can. Um, so more than happy if people want to ask questions, make any comments, Dr Cowan. Uh, just to hugely support the reference group, um, so I chair the uh, inequalities group and we only referenced uh, the work that you're doing earlier on the, today uh, when we had our um, fortnightly meeting, so um, well done and happy to continue to link through. Uh, Sonia Holdsworth, who works with um, Karen, I see at the back, um, mentioned the group that, you, um, that you're talking about today and um, we're really keen to, to work closer with you. And uh, one of the GPs on the uh, meeting was very keen to work alongside what you're doing. So I think uh, Sonia is going to link you in with her. That's great. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Khan. I assume that you will make those contact details with the GP who wants to work alongside them um, sort of outside of the meeting, but that will be really helpful. Um, Paul. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, very much welcome this paper. Uh, as, as Chief Executive of the Local Authority, uh, really welcome and recognise the work that the CV uh, and F sector uh, m contribute towards the, the borough. And I'm sure I speak on behalf of the other organisations here. Um, and I think it's timely to place on record our thanks to you in terms of your response in that humanitarian salon wider during the COVID response. I don't think the borough. Uh, or certainly the contribution made by the C CVF uh, sector actually made a real difference to, um, to our response during, during that period. Um, really, it's really important you uh, are part of the Health and Wellbeing Board and you are uh, making your, uh, your views known and shaping where, uh, where we go uh, over the next few years. The, the last point I'd make is that um, not only in the health and wellbeing space is it important we have your contribution, but also in, in the regeneration and growth as we start to redevelop uh, and build those, those new, new communities. So um, really just, as I say, for the record, place on thanks, uh, my thanks, for the work and support you've done over the last 18 months and looking forward to working with you both in this field but also on the regeneration and growth. Comments, questions. Councillor Gilchrist. Thank you, Chair. And naturally, welcome the close work that's envisaged. What I'm just working out how we get from one place to another. Uh, as Dr. Cowan was mentioning, the cooperation with uh, colleagues. Over the years, the primary care networks that have been formed in the last two or three years have presumably got quite a detailed picture of what they see as the needs and problems in those particular communities. And across those number of networks, There'll be a range of voluntary organisations. So I'm interested in the, what information, what picture of what needs are, what pictures of problems are recognised by the doctors that can be fed into the reference group so they can see how professionals see the problems in the community that need tackling and how that interaction will take place over as the new ICS system sets in, how that will develop over time. Thanks, Catherine. I think that sort of links into what Dr. Khan was just talking about, if you want to. Uh, thanks, Chair, and, and thanks, uh, Councillor Gilchrist. I, I think um, uh, what was said earlier about uh, working alongside uh, people, local people, is crucial and, and probably part of, of the question that you're asking, really. Um, the lived experiences of our patients and residents is crucial in how we take forward uh, how we deliver health and care, and particularly as we move into a, a wider geography across the ICS and then focusing on rural place. And, and the traditional, I think what we, it's really important, I, I mean, I'm a clinician, I'm a GP, 
but it's moving away from the very uh, traditional model of need to see the GP for my need and actually looking at what, what, what else is out there and the breadth of experience and knowledge that's within our health and care service, but also wider to that. So I've learned certainly through the last 18 months of COVID in a number of meetings that I both sit on and chair that the voluntary sector and the third sector organizations have a huge amount of input and channels and, and ways of contacting our residents so much more than I do in the 10 minutes or five minutes that I have with, with patients. And I think as we progress and as our primary care networks develop that community link, not only across health and care, but also that much wider third sector and voluntary and faith sector is, is crucial in how we look to deliver health and care because what I see as a clinician is only the tip of the iceberg. The wider determinants of health and care is what we really need to tackle, particularly if we want to get on top of and address health and care inequalities. So in answer to your question, Councillor Gilchrist, recognising that the skill mix across our allied healthcare professionals and our wider sector is really, really crucial to how we deliver for the people we serve. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And I think it's also recognising that um, people who are working closely in the local community um, have got the different skills, but they're skills that are just as essential as those of um, GPs or anybody else working as a health professional in that in that community. And uh, any other questions, comments? No. In that case, thank you very much, Kevin, for for that. And ag again, I will reiterate my thanks to Community Voice for making this happen, and to everyone. We do recognise that. All of you who work in the voluntary sector in whatever capacity um, are fully committed and yet you've managed to find time to commit to being a part of this reference group um, and for that we're extremely grateful. Um, I hope, as I say, as, as we look at the work that's going on, the, the report that's to follow um, and link to it, that uh, we will see real cooperation and, and close working right across the whole of the voluntary sector. Because as far as I'm concerned, the more people who can contribute, the more people who can feed into the work of this board um, and tell us what needs to be happening, what needs to be um, being done in the best interests of rural communities, the better. So um, as broad a range of view as possible, please, um, if you can, make the time to, um, to share your views with us and to comment on the work of this board. Thank you. It takes us on to item six, which is the um, report from Julie. Sorry, I've just been reminded. Oh, I'm just trying to chase. Um, just being reminded that uh, we needed to support the recommendation. Um, so I'm happy to move it. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Gilchrist, thank you. Right, Julie. Thank you, Chair. So the next item is, I'm going to be presented by myself, but also three colleagues who, if you'd like to come forward, so Karen Livesey, Amy Butterworth, and Lewis MacDonald. Um, who are really the people that are doing, doing the work. This is a complementary paper um, to the one that's just been prevented by, um, presented sorry, by Community Voice. You'll recall that back in March this year, we brought forward a proposed approach to working with the community voluntary and faith sector. And uh, you had a progress report in July of this year as well. So today we're doing a further update and I think you'll see within this paper hopefully some of the answers to some of the questions that you were just posing and I think that um, Amy, Karen and Lewis will I'm sure pick up some of the issues that we've just heard about but uh, again I just want to um, thank them for the hard work. We held a workshop 
in early September, which was really um, good news. And Chair, I know you were there, and I think that really showed the way that the CVF working together, of people, as people have already said today, building on the great work that's happened in this borough for years and years, but which COVID has really, I think, cemented and brought together. Um, I think you're going to hear this afternoon how that work's been taken forward. Thank you. Afternoon, Chair. Uh, I'd just like to start by going through a few points, which then will be picked up and carried forward by Karen and Amy. Uh, the report, uh, which kind of is, is, has been said, is complementary to the previous report. Uh, it was driven out of the humanitarian cell around about May, as well as a follow-on from work done in March, as Julie has said. Uh, we asked ourselves in the humanitarian cell, where do we go from here? Because we absolutely knocked our pans in during the pandemic, along with loads of other colleagues in the statutory sector. And uh, we wanted to know things were beginning to ease from the work we were doing. So what do we do next? How do we keep this going? Uh, and the, the work, the, the conference and the task and finish groups that we had, uh, that we set up, uh, involved about 100 community, voluntary and faith sector organisations. Uh, they, they have built on the work that the humanitarian cell have done. Uh, this work has already been endorsed by communities of practice group, chief officers group, humanitarian cell, the BAME and faith subgroups. We have all used channels to communicate progress and feedback through, throughout what we've been doing to ensure the sector has been fully included and nobody has been excluded. Uh, during the, the conference that we had, uh, we, we identified and, uh, five key areas that are most, most important to us and that we'd like to develop further. And we set up task and finish groups to take these forward, uh, led by different individuals. Uh, the first one uh, was around democratic representation. Uh, having a voice, uh, or the sector having a voice, uh, is important to us and uh, we have skills and insight that we want to share with our statutory partners in the public, uh, local government sector, uh, health sector uh, and other, other, other partners. Uh, we can complement and supplement, uh, fill gaps where there's resource issues uh, with our partners uh, and we're able to, as Dr Cowan uh, indicated, we, we can inform where efforts are best targeted within the borough because of the real low level intelligence we have of the need in the borough. Uh, and we want a single mechanism to ensure that communication is strong. Uh, during the pandemic, humanitarian cell uh, found itself a bit disenfranchised uh, with access to uh, partners, decision-making bodies, uh, although we, we, we tried to have a presence on those boards and bodies. Uh, the, and, and in second way, we want to focus on improving collaboration within our sector, but also across uh, our strategic partners, both statutory and non-statutory. Uh, working together, uh, we, we can definitely achieve more. Uh, we, we need to develop, or we would like to develop with you, a partners collaboration framework for Wirral. Uh, and, and that will allow us to identify a common understanding of what collaboration means, so we're all on the same playing field, and some common standards around how we collaborate internally, externally with each other. Uh, we, need, we definitely need to form better relationships with communities. Uh, and we need to help, we need to embed the ABCD principles. Uh, work started uh, in Wirral over six years ago on that, and we want to consolidate the work already undertaken and embed it fully uh, within local communities. Uh, another area we looked at, another task and finish group was behaviours. Uh, they, they're critical to underpinning everything 
that we, we would like to do going forward, uh, how we treat each other internally within the CVF sector, how we behave to each other, but also how we behave and interact and the language we use uh, with uh, our partners. Uh, we need to build trust and, and mature relationships. Uh, we we recognise this is a cultural piece. Uh, it's not going to be done overnight. Uh, we can't underestimate uh, how difficult this will be across such a hugely diverse sector and uh, such large partner organisations and smaller partner organisations. Uh, but we need to set a commitment of agreed behaviours uh, because this will give us all a, a degree of consistency and a, a guiding principle for going forward and how we behave. Uh, we should be able to challenge behaviours, but in a respectful manner. Uh, and if those behaviours are going to take us off track and where we want to go, uh, we, we need to reinforce those behaviours and then how we can work together in partnership for the benefit of the local people. Uh, so really, there's, there's a number of things there that we, we worked on as part of the Task and Finish groups. They're all interlinked, they're all important, and they, they're things we want to take forward with our partners uh, into the future to build something better for Wirral. Amy, Carmen. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so our fourth priority is looking at modernising volunteering. During the pandemic, the role of volunteers acted as a lifeline um, to the most vulnerable in society. We managed to engage a significant amount of volunteers and most importantly, opened it up to those residents of our borough who may have not considered it beforehand. Our ability to respond quickly and be flexible in our approach worked incredibly well. And we need to continue to progress these modernising plans rather than withdraw back to our traditional ways of working. We feel that by having a systems wide focus and plan for volunteering, we will maximise skills, resources across the borough, improving residents' wellbeing and providing capacity to both our CVS sector and public sector. Finally, we want to increase our role in tackling health inequalities. We are, trusted anchor, we are trusted anchor organisations working in the heart of those communities, as previously mentioned, and in Wirral um, can be the best way, and, can, sorry, um, and we will be keen to lead and drive this work with the support of yourselves and the CBS, CBF reference group through integrated working streams. In summary, Wirral have a strong and committed CBS sector that wants to grow and do more. But we need a longer term plan and to support to do this. We therefore ask the Health and Wellbeing Board to acknowledge this work to date, endorse the thematic groups and support involvement from our partners so we can co-design more. Um, agreement to integrate this work with the CVF re reference group and allow the CVF sector to bring a more detailed business case back to you guys for consideration in November. This will make recommendations for a CBF strategy, including investment, infrastructure, and the need to deliver our ambitions. Thank you. Thank you, um, Lewis, Karen, and Amy. Um, so, Chair, I think the, my colleagues have summed up really well the work that the sector's been doing and that uh, we want to uh, move forward on and we welcome the comments from the Health and Wellbeing Board on the paper in front of them and the recommendation which, sorry, is, I can't, yeah, is to note, is to note and, and comment on it. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Karen, did you want to speak on this? Uh, thank you, Chair. No, I'm just here to uh, answer any questions. Any questions, comments? Councillor Gilchrist. Thank you, Chair. I was just thinking back. When we met, or members met years ago in Acre Lane, when the gentleman from Canada came and gave talk to us, first of all, our asset-based community development. That must have been going back seven years or so. 
So since then, thanks to the work of Community Connectors and other organisations, a whole structure has been built up. Now, what I'm exploring is funding, because the first problem is you start something off, uh, find some resources, and then come up against a brick wall when the resources run out or aren't available in future years. So what I'm trying to track through is what kind of resources needed input to set this going, what kind of resource might be needed from our budget or from other sources to keep the work in train over time. Um, as, as the Director of Public Health, Julie, has what I call, was it contain outbreak management fund money and things like that, which I think are in place to something like September 22, but I can't remember the full detail of how the budget's applied. So if it's something is set up and gets running, and gets legs in inverted commas, and needs a regular resource in order to keep going and continue the work, that's what I'm trying to establish is what's needed so that we don't come up against some brick wall, run out of money, start scrabbling around trying to fund, find funding to keep worthwhile things going. That's what I'm exploring for you, Chair. Yeah, th thank you, Councillor Gilchrist, and absolutely, um, they're all the points I think we're wrestling with at the moment, and we want to come back again with a business plan which is fully costed, because all those points you raise are absolutely the things that we need to get to grips with, because we've had lots of nice words, people have done amazing work, but haven't had that um, commitment to funding in the past. So on the next steps really is to work, if the, if the board today is supportive of the paper and the outline and the five work streams that we've put forward, we wanted to take that away, build up a business plan and come back and talk to partners, the council uh, and other partners to see, do we as statutory partners really believe in this and are we actually going to put some money behind this and to fund this and take it forward? So for some of us that have been around a while, I, including myself, I'm really talking about myself, um, you know, we remember things like compacts when there used to be an agreement about how we work together across statutory community and voluntary faith sectors, which we haven't got at the moment. So it's things like that that we're wanting to put back into, back into a process, into a framework, get that agreement across the borough, recognise the fantastic work that's happened in the CBF, but let's do this on an equal footing and let's hear from the CBF, which is what they're doing at the moment. They're really developing their own business plan. We'll work with them on that. We'll work with them to make sure it's fully costed and then we can have another conversation about the commitment across everybody. Thank you. Councillor Anderson. Thanks, Chair. And just uh, briefly, it's really to echo what uh, Councillor Gilchrist and, and, and Julie said, I think, I mean, I mean, Karen will remember, it's, it's about 10 years ago, isn't it, since uh, Karen was my line manager very briefly, so, and we were talking about these issues then uh, when we worked for Community Voluntary Action Wirral, and uh, it's actually quite sad that, you know, we're, a decade later we're still uh, mentioning this, the, the same problems. Um, I really welcome the report and, and the recommendations in there and on, on, on the funding. I'm particularly interested in the volunteer sector. I think the pandemic actually highlighted that you know what a wonderful job the outbreak management board did and all of our volunteers then, and we want to capitalise on that, especially those volunteers who have signed up. In some circumstances, it is extremely difficult to to sign up, but it's also using those as a funnel, as the chief exec said earlier. It's, of course, we've got to tackle our health in, in, inequalities. And we want we want to do that, but it's also about how they feed into our regeneration program across the council, our lo our Leicester strategy. So it, probably more of a comment, but I don't know if anyone else wants to comment. It's how do we feed that feeds into this business plan? Have we got a buy-in from all the partners around the table? And then the key question is the funding there, as Councillor Gilchrist said, because I think we've got an ideal opportunity now um, to make the a positive out of what, where we were with COVID to actually accelerate, accelerate this and finally get and tackle those problems that have existed, well, probably more than a decade, but since I was made aware of them. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Here you go. So if I can try and answer Councillor Anderson's question, I, I 
I think the, the developments we're starting to see in the integrated commissioning system uh, on a Cheshire Merseyside basis, I think um, as that evolves and we start to um, position the health and wellbeing board into that space and build on that partnership with, the, with our part health, health, health and other partners around the table, I see the health and wellbeing board uh, linking in those regeneration and growth plans and, and the leisure strategy that this becomes a vehicle at a strategic level almost where we get that collective buy-in from all interested parties um, and, there, and potentially we will have to address some of those funding issues as well through this but I'm my view and I think the view of the the chief execs of the health partners is that this forum and the relationships built over the past 18 months provides that opportunity like never before that we've seen on will so Hopefully, if we're sat here in 10 years' time, we're not having the same, the same conversation. Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, uh, Dr. Khan. Sorry, j just to echo what Paul said, that how we did things in the past, we, we have to learn from that and reflect on that and, and take that forward and some things we didn't do so well and some things we did really well but if the, 18, if the past 18 months has taught us anything it's 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 like what i was saying earlier it's beyond health and care it, and it's working across our system and it's the input that colleagues out there at grassroots level working with our community working with our residents our population our patients under whatever guise we see people that's that that wealth of intelligence and that lived experience has to form the basis of how we start to work forward and that's what integration and collaboration is all about and Wirral is perfect for doing that because we have a really good local hospital and a really great community trust and a mental health trust and, and lots of really great GPs but that's health We've got an excellent social care service under Graham and Paul and public health under Julie. But beyond that, we have you know, people who've come today to talk about what's happening at a, at a you know, grassroots level and, and colleagues within Health Watch who are listening to the feedback from our residents, people in MENCAP who work with people with learning disabilities, Health Junction, Age UK, all of those other services who can really help me in what I do as a clinician. And that has to become embedded into business as usual. And so it can't be, isn't that a nice thing to do? Yes, it is, but it has to be imperative to how we take things forward. Because continuing to do what we did over and over again is, as Einstein said, the definition of madness. So I'll leave you with that one. Okay. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks Councillor Khan. Councillor Khan, Dr. Khan. <laughs> no, it's okay, don't worry. <laughs> I, w I wasn't uh, pushing you forward into that role. Not that you want it. Um, right, any, um, any other comments, questions? Right, okay. Yeah, I absolutely, um, this, this report is really really helpful it's really useful because what it it shows is that the um, CVF sector is is working out how it's going to work together how it's going to form itself into um, which it needs to do um, into uh, into the ways in which it can work alongside an integrated care system it's absolutely essential that that's got to happen um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be in statute, but it has to happen um, because things are going to change so much in terms of how um, our local health and care is delivered. And it's absolutely essential that the CVF sector has a seat at the table right from the start. And unless you're able to do that in a kind of coherent way, which is so difficult because sector itself is so incredibly diverse um, but the fact that you are working on that that you're looking at how you can um, form yourselves into something which 
can be a part of this whole new integrated care partnership is absolutely vital for all of us um, because without it, as you all know only too well, um, and I think now everybody in the public sector has realised that we fall over without you. Um, and that was definitely proved during the pandemic. Um, so um, I really look forward to the development of the work that you're doing um, and as to how this will take, go forward in terms of the involvement of the CVS sector in our development work around our integrated care partnership here on Wirral. So I'm happy to, um, to move the recommendation to our second for that. Councillor Anderson, thank you. So can I thank you all very much for your part in that and thank you, Julie, for the report. Now, our next item is a Health Watch update, um, which we'd asked. Unfortunately, uh, Karen Pryor is ill. Um, if people have got comments on the Health Watch update, I'm happy to leave the item on the agenda. And then maybe if there are questions that, uh, that need answering, then we could ask Karen to. Um, to do that at the next meeting. Or if people would prefer, um, we can leave the whole item. I'm in the hands of the board on that one. People have read the report um, and have any questions. Graham. Um, it's not really a question. Um, I, I think that's helpful. Um, but just, just to say that, um, that there is a um, significant element of this report which uh, sets out the concerns of um, members of the public in relation to uh, access to general practitioners. Um, I had the um, pleasure of being at the partnerships uh, committee last night where that was looked at in, in some detail. And uh, I do understand that the, um, the work in relation to um, access to, to primary care um, is, is something that um, Partnerships Committee are quite keen to take forward through their scrutiny role. So uh, just really, it's feedback for Karen really is to say that there is a piece of work that will link to, I think, some of the primary themes that have been picked up in this report. Chair. Thank you, Matthew. Chair. Um, uh, Matthew Swinborough from uh, the Acute Trust. Um, well, similar to Graham, we've, um, we've also reviewed this uh, as an organisation and taken on board some of the, the positive themes, certainly around Arrow Park Hospital, and then some of the challenges that, that we're facing at the moment uh, that, that, that are highlighted here and, and how we can draw those in through our various improvement programs and, and also committees. Councillor Gilchrist. Well, thank you, Chair. And Graham has reminded me I had the pleasure of watching Partnerships Committee on my computer and enjoyed uh, in getting a greater understanding from what the Liverpool doctor said about the trends in the health service and the pressure on GPs. His uh, comments were often very frank, also very enlightening, especially his concerns about e-consult, for example. So it was interesting to have a perspective from somebody outside Wirral with, a, with that experience. I think he said he had like 40 years experience as a GP from training and learning and uh, had many lessons to give us. So that was very refreshing. And as Martin has said, uh, taking the positive themes about praise for A&E staff, as someone who was in A&E recently and then in hospital for almost three days, I'd like to... Um, just take the opportunity to say how well staff in A&E spent their time putting this um, ageing 69-year-old gentleman at rest and explaining what might have happened to him when I happened to fall off a ladder and bang my head. So, you know, staff were caring, interested, followed through, was kept informed, uh, explained throughout what was happening to me, which was wonderful, and then I probably um, 
um, gave those staff from the ward I was on some interesting moments as they tried to cope with me. But it was <laughs> a very, um, shall we say, experience that um, any member of the public has of the health service. Thankfully, we don't often end up in those circumstances, but I found it uh, very interesting, rewarding, and satisfying to see how staff worked throughout the night on that ward, caring for people and make, watching their progress. So there's, there's some praise to add for the positive themes in the Wuth report. And uh, I hope that perhaps when members have looked at the partnerships committee on the recording, they too find a perspective from GPs who are generally doing their best in the circumstances, but often because of shortages or recruitment difficulties, really uh, trying to stay afloat and offer a, a levels of service through very many means at their surgeries. Thank you. I'm sure Matthew will take that back. Uh, yes, certainly, Chair. Um, thank you, Councillor. We'll, we'll make sure that that's included as, um, as an update. Um, I might actually also invite you um, to, to maybe come and um, provide a video for, for one of our board meetings uh, of your experience. Anyone got comments on the Health Watch update or got questions we want to refer to Karen? I always find these, these updates absolutely fascinating. I think the amount of data that Health Watch collect um, is quite staggering, really. The, the, um, the sheer numbers of um, pieces of data that they actually have. Um, I, I, would, and I really do think it's something we need to make more use of, probably, than we do, because they're really, really useful. It's really important that we're able to turn this data into useful information um, that we can use across all of our organisations. I think it will benefit all of us. Um, I was certainly fascinated to read the report, um, and I know, I mean, we've had discussions, and I'm sure that the um, that primary care are currently engaged in discussions and I know the digital group is engaged in discussions around e-consult because um, that's a big issue. Do you want to comment, Councillor? Uh, I've done it again. Do, I want, do you want to comment, Dr. Cowan? Thank you, Chair. <laughs> I, I, I've read the um, report and... Um, both Karen and Misha come to a number of different groups uh, that I uh, sit on and their feedback is always hugely uh, welcomed because it goes back to what we said earlier about those lived experiences of our residents. And, and I think looking at this document, it's, it's really positive to see the, um, the feedback of the delivery of health and care across our whole system and although it's broken down by organisation, I think it's a positive uh, um, reflection of the, the delivery of healthcare uh, across Wirral. Um, I recognise that, that the, there has been a lot of um, attention around uh, how easily or rather lack thereof it is to access primary care at the moment. And, and that's a, certainly something that we are working with our colleagues across the, the system on uh, in terms of uh, looking at there is no one fix for everybody and I know that the um, digital model of e-consult has been referenced on a number of times but actually it's looking more at a hybrid and, and what's right for individuals rather than a strict it must be this way or that way and when you look at January to June of this year General practice offered over 790,000 appointments in Wirral. 700, yeah, 700 and let me see, 791,889 uh, appointments um, uh, in general practice in 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 Wirral uh, since from January to June. So, whilst I, as a clinician, might say, well, you know, I'm working really, really hard. I think it's important to recognise that. If our, if our residents can't get an appointment, that's their reality and that's what they're experiencing. And we need to turn that around and look at how we can do that better for them. 
but I think overall the, the paper is really, really positive about how we deliver health and care, and certainly around the COVID vaccination programme, uh, which came very, very quickly to us and has been delivered in a very, very slick, streamlined manner and continues to, to be so uh, with the booster programme and the 12 to 15 year olds as well. Thanks. Anderson. Thank you, Chair. It's, it's just a comment, really, on, on what you said there. I mean, I, I didn't realise that that's a lot of appointments, so over 700,000 in six months. You know, it's, it's, it's two appointments for every member of the population of Wirral there. So it, just a question, is that typical? Um, you know, the amount of access people are going to, the population's going to GPs in that, because that, that to me is quite staggering, two appointments equivalent of two appointments for every member of the population of rural, maybe more. I know, and I think what we have to remember is that statistically that is two per population, isn't it, when you're looking at a 300,000 population, but actually some patients will need an awful lot more and some won't have used or act, tried to access general practice in that time. And so if you have somebody with a long-term condition where it's exacerbating or there's a deterioration or a palliative patient who may have a number of interactions. So we can break that down, we can look at that. Uh, but that's simply um, looking at it, uh, appointments and issued 276,007 prescriptions for residents. And that's not including COVID-19 appointments. So I think whilst, is that typical? I think it's more than we've done in previous years. But it's different. So when you break down face-to-face -face and e-consults and telephone consultation, there is, it is different to previous years, but the overall interaction is more now than it was previously. Yeah. All right. OK, thank you very much. And if no further comments, well, certainly, um, if we can feed back to Karen Pryor that um, the board's appreciation of the report and how helpful, useful we found it. Thank you. Um, the recommendation is that we note the report. I'm happy to move that. Seconder? Councillor Clements, thank you. That brings us on to um, <coughs> this brings us on to Julie, who's going to present the Public Health Annual Report. Is that what's on the screen, Julie? It is, Councillor. Yeah, thank you. So, as many of you in the room know, the Public Health Annual Report is, an independent, is my independent annual report and is a statutory requirement. Um, this report for 2020-21 describes enduring health inequalities in Wirral, um, the immediate impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on these differences in health outcomes and recommended actions that we need to take to improve everyone's health. I think a reflection from me is I could have written this report probably five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, because actually what's in here and the health inequalities that are described in here are quite stark and we all know them probably far too well. And then just reflecting on Councillor Anderson's point before around the CVF and the fact that um, what he heard today was something he'd heard 10 years, you could have heard 10 years ago. So I think there's something for me in this report about how we hear these messages and what are we going to do about it and how are we going to make a difference so that the people sitting in this room in 10 years' time aren't having the same conversations. So that's my challenge to the partners in the room and to myself and to my team about how do we really make a difference. And so people who are in this uh, role in the future aren't presenting reports such as the one I'm going to do today. Having said that, uh, I've spent quite some time thinking about what to call the report and you'll see it's called Embracing Optimism because actually I think what we've all lived through over the last um, 18 months should give us some optimism that we can do things differently if we work together in the way that we've done in the past and things can change if we continue to have that 
ethos of working with each other, being very focused on the outcomes, having the person, the resident, the patient at the forefront of our minds, and leaving behind organisational organizational structures and boundaries that perhaps we've, uh, we've used perhaps somewhat as a smokescreen in the past. So just to go on to the next slide, please. And I think, I think we could all say that, really, couldn't we? What a year it's been. And I'm, I'm looking at Paul, because I remember ringing Paul, and he, he already knew, but I was like, we're having guests from Wuhan in China, and Matthew, <laughs> they're coming to stay at Arab Park Hospital, and this was in January 2020. Um, yeah, I'm sort of smiling and laughing, but that wasn't quite, I think, the reaction we had at the time. Um, but I think what that did do is it showed us how little Wirral, who isn't usually on the front page of, of newspapers, we came together, worked really hard, really well across the health and social care sector with our voluntary uh, and community groups. And we, I think, did ourselves proud, and we particularly did the people that came to came to us as guests, we did them proud uh, in what was a very, very difficult um, situation. So COVID-19 has absolutely been the biggest health challenge that's affected us all for generations. And again, a reflection from me, um, public health, we were always told a pandemic was coming our way and you know, you would nod your head and you'd be trained because a pandemic was coming your way. I think we thought it was probably gonna be flu and we had a little bit of um, you know, an example of that what was it, 12 years ago, um, but we never thought that, I never thought I'd be Director of Public Health in the middle of a global pandemic. And by golly, it's really given us challenges, hasn't it? But whilst the pandemic has touched us all, it hasn't had uh, an equal impact on all of us. And I think it's also shown us, hasn't it, how valuable our health is and how by staying healthy, we can protect each other. Next slide, please. So I think what this pandemic has absolutely done is held up that mirror to the existing health, economic and social inequalities that we've got within the borough. But unfortunately, it hasn't fallen equally on all people. So our health inequalities, which we talk about, have been made worse for some, and it's absolutely had an impact on the quality of people's lives, the way our residents use our services. And again, we were just having a conversation about the use of um, GP services and how individuals and the economy prosper. Next slide, please. This is just a slide which, for people who are interested in public health, we use this a lot to really show that. And this is why the Health and Wellbeing Board is so important. Our health is not just about the NHS. In fact, the bit that the NHS does is really quite small. It's very much about our jobs. It's very much about our education. It's very much about where we live. And I think that's why the Health and Wellbeing Board is so important to bringing together partners that can have an influence on all these different determinants of people's health and well-being. Next slide, please. So this will be a slide that people will be familiar with. And this is, I think, the sort of thing we need to challenge ourselves on. So we all know we've got a 10-year life expectancy difference in males and females across the borough. And we can put them on these nice maps and we can put them to the... Um, the railway um, stations that we have, but we need to start to do something about it instead of just going, oh yes, that's interesting, oh yes, that's what we thought, oh yes, we've got our east-west split, yes, we're used to that. So that's the challenge uh, coming from this uh, annual report. You've obviously got data in here because that's what public health does, and here's a slide that shows you the uh, what we call the statistics that go across our, our life course. Um, What's really good, I think, is that in some cases, we're doing better than the England average. So our flu vaccination coverage is better than the England average. I think the way that we've rolled out the COVID vaccination um, programme, again, has also shown how we work well together and we can do these programmes. A great success from my perspective is the fact that our smoking pre prevalence in adults has come right down and we're below the England average significantly. And that, again, is testament to work across the system and with local people. But you'll see that unfortunately we've still got quite a few. They're not red, but they're pink in this, uh, on this slide. So a number of um, statistics where we are not, um, not doing well, not performing well. And that includes things such as obviously life expectancy at birth and the healthy life expectancy that we have. So for those of us who are living longer lives, we're not necessarily living those longer lives in, in good health. 
So what do we do about it? And that's the challenge I know that you will all, all make to me. As I've mentioned, I think we've made some great progress in supporting people to live healthier lives. But now I think we have got this opportunity to reduce that gap between our communities and the rest of England. Or if we don't work together, that that poor health will continue within the borough. And we do know, as I said right at the beginning, that we can work really well together and at pace to make change happen. So there are a number of recommendations uh, within the report and I did trial these with you um, back in July, uh, the five recommendations that you've got here, which are around prioritising economic regeneration and a strong local economy. We have got amazing opportunities around that um, and I think it's really important to understand with our regeneration agenda, how do we make sure that local people absolutely see and have the aspiration that I know that um, my regeneration colleagues have got for that. We need to think about the healthy standard of living for all as well. We need to increase support for children, young people and families, strengthen action to address differences in health outcomes and prevention, and as we've heard very um, strongly this afternoon, continue the work with residents and partners. So underneath those five titles, you'll see on the following slides that there's a number of recommendations. And in the first one around the economic regeneration and strong local economy, there's a number of asks I've got there of my regeneration colleagues around how we absolutely make sure that those development plans that we've got in place really have health and well-being at the heart of them and really think about how we make sure, as I've said, that what's going to happen within this borough really, really um, delivers the outcomes that we want for local people. Just to say that I am going on a bit of a road show with these slides, so these will be going to the various committees across the council and obviously to any of the partners' boards if you wish to, because it would be what I really need to be able to do is really um, illustrate how these recommendations are being put into practice. The second slide is, or second priority, or recommendation rather, is around that healthy standard of living for all. Again, lots of challenges within the borough around our housing strategy. Really want to uh, ensure, working with our housing college, that they reflect the changing needs of our residents. I'm sitting next to the Director of Adult Social Care and then all the work that's um, happening through adult social care with regard to supported living, etc. Really important that as we have an ageing population that we have the right uh, housing stock, stock for them. There's also issues, um, comments in here as well, about the information and advice offer that we have within the borough, which has been invaluable during the pandemic. And want to build on the great work that we've done during the pandemic as well about supporting people who are homeless. You'll see that there's another couple of recommendations there as well around fuel poverty and the use of a tool called Health Impact Ass Assessment in spatial planning. And I heard this morning that we are going to be doing a HIA, Health Impact Assessment, of the new um, park that we want to do in, in Birkenhead. Forgive me, I can't remember its title at the moment, but uh, Doc Branch Park, thank you very much. The third recommendation is around our children, young people and families. Um, obviously, the impact on our young people um, has been significant during the pandemic. And we really need to make sure, and I know that Simon um, and I got a good working relationship, it's really about how we support and inform the offer for early years as we go forward. And make sure that early health and intervention model is absolutely embedded in all of our work. The fourth recommendation is really, I suppose, my call to action in some respects to the NHS and with all the changes that are happening to the NHS from a commissioning perspective is about how do we really make sure that tackling inequalities is fundamental to healthcare provision? How do we make sure that the offer that we have within Birkenhead is absolutely focused on the needs of the Birkenhead population compared to, say, Heswell, West Kirby uh, or Egremont, for example? So it's how do we make sure that we have a needs-based service going forward? I know that the NHS has got lots of this within their planning uh, framework, but I think it's how do we make it real? How do we bring it out? And how do we ensure that people understand that things will be different? And I think just a final point on that slide, I can't not mention it. 
If there's one thing surely we've learned over the past 18 months is about the importance of good infection and prevention control, basic uh, hand hygiene, for example, making sure that people just follow some of those basic health promotion campaigns and messages that are so, so important to keeping us all safe. And then the final recommendation is around how we as residents and partners continue to work together. And I think you've heard that very strongly and clearly from the CBF sector this afternoon. And I can't um, endorse that enough, um, that that's an approach that we need to continue going forward. So I hope you'll find it interesting, thought provoking. I uh, really think, yes, there's something in here that I really need to grab hold of and move forward. That's what this report is about. That's what public health annual reports should be about. It's about taking a topic, being provocative, making sure that people can see that this is a real issue for us, but that we can do something about it. And hope that you can see from the recommendations in there, there's plenty we can do. We just need to take the challenge to actually go and do it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Julie. Any um, comments on that? Graham. Just to get the ball rolling, thank you very much, Julie. It's a really helpful um, report and presentation. I think that um, those five key priorities are really hard-hitting priorities, and I think um, I, I think for me this board has a role in really making the shift from them being uh, these are the priorities of the Director of Public Health to these are our priorities um, through um, developing them into the health and wellbeing strategy for the borough, which becomes our strategy. So I think it's very important that the Director of Public Health has indicated to us what some of the key areas of need are and some of the key priorities. And I think we now need to um, take those and develop them into that, uh, into that full strategy that we then um, can align to the system plans. And I think that there's a really helpful reference there into the changes in, in the health system. And uh, within that system, there's a, a clarity that the health and wellbeing strategy of the borough is going to be one of the key determinants for the plans for the, for the whole system. So I think um, taking these and, and building on them would be really helpful. Thank you. Right. Uh, Tony and then Councillor Clements. Thank you, Chair. Um, hi, Tony Bennett, Whittle Community Trust. Julia, just wanted to thank you for that presentation. It's very much what we need to do as we move forward into the future with a focus on outcomes and just to take your offer up and say we'd welcome you coming to our organisation to present this and talk about how we actually take this into action in the next steps and the importance of us all working together collectively and collaboratively on this journey as well so we can address the issues. So just thank you very much. Thank you, Julie. It's, it's a really interesting report. I, I could be flippant and say that the map with the, um, the train lines on shows that my community is deprived because it doesn't have a train line. But <laughs> it, I, I would more importantly like to say that when I read about the, um, the recommendations and the ones around children, young people and families, um, I think our committee's work programme and, and all of the councillors across um, the committee would recognise that we're, we're on the journey of those things but there is more and more to be done and we're absolutely I'm sure with you. I welcome you to come and say that at the committee if you wish. Thank you. Any further comments anywhere? Simone. Thank you. I'd just like to thank Julie as well and endorse the report. I think it's a very good read and sets very clearly the direction of travel for us. I think now the question is, is open to the floor and us that Julie asked, how do we actually turn it into reality? And, you know, I know that for one, I will want to speak to Julie more about what we can do about the workshops and the work we need to really ensure that we are reviewing and embedding those principles not only creating new work streams, but in what we're doing now and making sure that being driven forward. So I look forward to being able to come back and report, uh, as I'm sure the Children's Committee does on the children's strand of it. But I think the important thing is that we keep pulling it all together because whatever happens in that children's part of the world, 
will reflect in the adults in the other part of the world. So I really welcome the opportunity to fetch that back as an entity and report to this committee in entirety how we're doing against all of those recommendations. Councillor Gilchrist. It might be that Councillor Clements has success one day if we ever get the Borderlands Railway Line, mid rural Line with the trains running through to Wrexham. We can have a few more stations in key places like Woodchurch and then we can see um, impact across the borough. Now, on a more serious point, there are, I think, 24 recommendations overall and the issue for all of us is how do those crop up every day and how do people measure what they're doing against them. I was thinking back 30 odd years to when there was a road in Birkenhead called T Street when Councillor Perkins was on the council he highlighted um, something like a street with 30 houses with only one family in work or training. Um, we've come some way since then but the problems of inequality and as the report mentions I think uh, one of the comments is precarious work and zero hour contracts is mentioned by Julie in the report and if we can get away from the world of precarious work and uncertainty then the anxiety amongst residents about their future might um, subside but we clearly still have a long way to go in order to fulfill those five key objectives about safeguarding a healthy standard of living for all and strengthening action to address differences in health outcomes and prevention which has been with us probably for as long as I've been a councillor, which is over 40 years now, which every uh, in administration and every government has tried to set their shoulder to the wheel to sort out, and it really has been some an uphill job for any government of any persuasion to try and turn the world round, and therefore all we can do is hope that there is success in achieving what we'd like to see done. Dr. Cowan. Uh, Chair, thanks. Uh, Julie, excellent report, thanks. It's really, really good. And I think just to pick up on what Councillor Gilchrist said, we can keep talking about things, can't we? And we can keep saying this is what, but actually, I think what, what the last, you know, we, we keep discussing what the last 18 months, it'll be 19 months soon, won't it? It won't sound as good. But um, what the, the COVID pandemic has demonstrated to us is how we can do things quickly and how we can be innovative in our thinking and how we can pull together and work together and actually there's nothing in that in those recommendations that anybody would argue with and it's about doing what's right for the people we serve and actually we owe them a, a, we have a duty of care to the people we serve and we can talk about it but actually it's really important that we start to embed that into our psyche but also, and it goes back to what we spoke about earlier, it's embedding it into the psyche of our residents. And we, we, you know, we talk about uh, you know, educating patients on where the best place to go when they have a clinical need is and how we can educate our population. When actually, it's, it's working with the, the faith sector and Health Watch and Age UK and, and working with those people who've had those lived experiences on how we can turn things around so that it's bottom up and so that when we're looking at areas of deprivation and where we're looking at you know the, the slide that Julie showed there down that A41 corridor that we bring people from those areas with us on this you know journey and say this is how how can we work with you in order to address these these inequalities and these issues and how can we work with you in order to take this forward so hugely supportive of it Julie so you know Let's catch up. Any other comments? Well, just to remain for me to thank you, Julie, for an excellent report that has really focused down, I think, on the issues that concern us all um, and has helped us, I think, immeasurably um, as a board and hopefully much, much wider as, as a public sector on Wirral. Um, when you've done your roadshow and gone around all of these different places, 
um, all of these different committees with your report. Um, and hopefully, as I say, we will be able to use your recommendations as a basis um, to help us understand what we need to be achieving um, and also to hold each of us, to hold each other to account about whether or not we are achieving the things that we need to do. Um, I absolutely welcome your reference to children and young people. Um, everything we do, we do for their future. Um, it's, it's their world we're protecting. It's their local area we're developing. Not for most of us, it's for, it's for the children and the young people that we're doing it. So that's really, really pleased to see them in, um, in your recommendations, Julie. Um, Councillor Anderson, I know you've returned from an essential work call. Um, we have now just completed Julie's excellent uh, presentation on the report. I'm assuming you've read it. Um, and whether you have any questions for Julie before we conclude the item. I was just saying it's going to be really useful. We're going to get it around all the committees, um, all the relevant committees. Um, and also our health partners have already indicated that they would welcome um, Julie presenting that report. Um, and I was just in the process of saying that it provides us all with some very useful benchmarks that we can measure ourselves against to whether we truly are delivering what we need to be delivering for people. Um, but if you're content with that, I'm going to move um, that we endorse the recommendations that are detailed within this report. Can I have a second for that, please? Can I have a second? Thank you. Which moves us on to the pharmaceutical needs assessment. That's you again, Yeah, Julie. I'm sorry. Yes, it is me again. Thank you. Um, as a health and wellbeing board, we have a responsibility for the publication and update of the local pharmaceutical needs assessment, or the PN, PNA, uh, for those who uh, love it or hate it. Um, anyway, the process for producing a new PNA for Wirral uh, began in spring 2020 uh, with a view to publishing it this March, but obviously something happened in the meantime and publication nationally was agreed to be put back until September 2022. So the report in front of you details the proposed process to produce the new PNA for Wirral and it's asking the board to um, and endorsed me to take the necessary steps to produce the next PNA on or before the 30th of September 2022. The report uh, details it's um, prescriptive to us, the way we have to go out to consult, the work we need to do, so it is quite uh, labour intensive. We work across um, the Merseyside local authorities to support each other to do it and um, I'm hoping that the board will um, endorse the recommendations that are on page 129. Thank you, Chair. Any comments, questions? Councillor Anderson? No. Oh, you're just sorting your glasses out. Oh, okay, fair enough. It's a bit like being at an auction, isn't it? Don't stick your hand up and you end up having bought a grand piano or something. Right, okay. Um, well, that sounds like we're asking you to do another whole load of work, Julie. Um, but I'm happy to move those recommendations that you basically crack on with the PNA over the next 12 months. Second to that. Councillor Anderson, thank you. Okay. Then we have the work programme, which is Vicky. I'm sorry, I've missed. Oh, how I've well, it's sorry. It's just on this. It goes from eight to nine, and then oh, then to twelve. On oh, my, that's what's happened. It's all right. I'm looking at the um, the index on the side, which takes me from nine to twelve without me noticing. I do apologise. Um, right, integration care systems update, please, Graham. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. 
Uh, this report is intended to be informative and uh, in essence it sets out the progress of the Health and Care Bill and the developments in relation to um, proposals around the integrated care system, the integrated care partnerships and place-based partnerships. Um, it does come with a health warning. Um, the uh, bill is currently at committee stage which means that uh, it's subject to a line-by-line -line read through um, at this stage. So clearly anything I refer to today is still in progress in, in terms of the, the bill progressing through, through its relevant stages uh, with government. One of the key things really that is important within the paper and within the, the whole developing legislation is the importance of health and wellbeing boards at place. Um, and uh, it's highlighted in this report really due to its key role in um, having oversight of those place-based partnership arrangements. And I think today's conversations have really shown how that's intended to work. So we've heard about arrangements in relation to hearing from our public through the um, community, voluntary and faith sectors. And we've heard from the Director of Public Health in relation to key recommendations around how we can deal with inequality much better and focus much more on equity. Um, the plan for Wirral, the Wirral plan, is, is one which absolutely takes that equity um, further forward. So, um, in essence, this legislation is really intended to bring together the structural changes in the NHS with those place-based arrangements that really make sure that what we end up with is a system that's absolutely fit for purpose and that works together in a very collaborative way in order to deal with health inequality at a local level. Um, potential place-based governance arrangements are highlighted in section two of the report and um, these were discussed uh, recently with elected members in an open workshop to, for, for members on the 14th of September. Um, but just to say there's also a system-wide governance workshop which is planned for the 8th of October which will further develop proposed governance arrangements for the borough and uh, would enable us then to take those proposals back through the Adult Social Care and Public Health Committee on the 13th of October, in essence setting out what system proposals are supported by partners across the borough uh, in order then to uh, feed those back to the um, Cheshire and Merseyside ICS uh, as, as part of the kind of developments. Hopefully then they'll be supported and that we can you know, uh, begin to uh, foster those and progress them to the next stage. Section 3 sets out the primary elements of the bill uh, and the role of the ICS, um, the, the, integrate, uh, the integrated care system, the integrated care partnership and uh, the NHS um, Integrated Commissioning Board. Um, and the, the ICB is an important part of this because that's the key place at Cheshire and Merseyside level that will lead the health and care system. Um, and it's really important that uh, most of our conversations really in terms of governance, in terms of what, what we want to do as place, are really about being able to um, have a delegation from the um, ICB at Cheshire and Mersey level so that what we would seek is a delegation of duties and responsibilities uh, to our place. So intentionally really the report then focuses a little more on the place-based partnership and um, really how, how that would develop and what we would expect the place-based partnerships to be able to deliver. Um, both in relation to uh, provider collaboration, that um, very collaborative part of this, and of course, you know, we talked earlier about, again, community, voluntary and faith sector, and they would be part of a provider collaborative, along with, you know, our, our very important key NHS providers and local authority. Uh, but also, um, it uh, sets out issues around commissioning at place and how we would seek to ensure that as we commission for the people that live in our borough, that we have a, a joined up and integrated strategy for uh, commissioning the right sorts of things for them. So this report is primarily for noting at this stage, um, but as I say, it's intended to be informative and helpful.
Thanks. Thanks very much um, for that, Graham. Um, I think it's all it can be at this stage, and it is informative. Nobody's at any stage yet, because we don't actually know what is going to finally come out when it emerges from the committee stage. Um, then we'll have a clearer picture of exactly what we've got in terms of the legislation we're going to work to. Um, so at this moment, the best we can do is continue with what we've got and um, make our plans accordingly. Any comments? Matthew, thank you. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, uh, uh, Graham, I, I think you, you've summarised it well, um, the, the document and, and outlined the, the progress that we're on as a place. Um, uh, as you highlighted, th there is significant issues around the, 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 the fact that the guidance and also the, the legislation is still going through the House. Um, I, I feel we have come together quite strongly as a system, um, bringing together um, both NHS and, and council as well as elements of the voluntary sector to start to develop how we'll place partnership work and operate uh, ready, to, ready to go really for April. Uh, next year, and also, in, really importantly, the, the role of that partnership and, and the, the, the role of the Health and Wellbeing Board as well. So, um, the, the trust is certainly supportive of, of the paper, uh, and certainly the, the direction of travel at the moment. Councillor Gilchrist. Thank you, Chair. I mean, at the moment, things seem to be progressing. And we come to a point where there's like a year where things settle down and then we come to a further point where controversies start to arise. So I'd paint it that way. But I think because the new body will start looking at details of budgets and will start asking about equalities and inequalities, that all of us who look at inequality and, will, and the problems of will have to be alert to the way things might go, because there might well become times where the body circulating above us says, we think we want to redistribute resources, and there could be a point where some of our aspects of our budgets are, you can say, squeezed or spirited away, be the wrong language, but might be uh, carefully removed over time. So I'm watching rather carefully this way things are developing. I'm almost tempted to see it as a, a camel designed by a committee. I think we always used to have terrible jokes about if you were trying to design something and you ended up with a camel, how did you get there? But the problem is um, being alert to things that can w go wrong, but equally being appreciative of the things that can go right. So uh, I'm cautious at the moment about how things are going. What strikes me as the key is genuine scrutiny about what's going on. And if there are to be changes in structures and hospitals and key services at a higher level to make sure that we are consulted and get the chance to influence transitions that might take place. Thank you, Councillor Gilchrist. I mean, I think the key strategy here really is that we've been working together very closely to show that we're able to collaborate and that we can work really well as a system because we want those decisions to be as close to our population as they can be. So the higher level of delegation that we can achieve from the Cheshire and Mersey integrated care system, and the more involvement and engagement our elected members, our health leaders, and our communities will have in any decisions that are made about our system. Um, when we looked at the governance arrangements, and you've seen within the paper, there are five type, different types of um, governance arrangements. And one of those is where the area is simply consulted um, by the ICB in, in relation to uh, any changes that are proposed. Now clearly that's at the other end of the scale where the local system isn't able to work together and, and hasn't really put the arrangements in place um, to have that integrated system. What we're aiming for here is to have a much more integrated system working together so that we can get that collaboration and we can get that, that delegation of resource. So um, certainly the next paper on the agenda today talks about the pooled funds and some of the resources that go with that and I think gives some of the detail as to why it's important that we have those in place because that does give us the local leadership and the ability to 
uh, certainly um, have leverage in, in those decisions that are made for our po local population. Hope that helps. Sorry, I couldn't see it down there, Paul. Thanks, uh, thanks, Chair. So, so I'd, I'd echo, Councillor Gilchrist, so I'd echo what, what Graham has said and really emphasise um, the, the whole idea is to get as much delegation down to place as we can by, uh, by, uh, by the end of the year. Uh, there will be some criteria that we think we'll have to, we'll have to meet to achieve that. Um, you, you referred really to structural changes around things like the hospitals and perhaps I'll ask Matthew to come in because I don't see the structural changes any at the, certainly at this stage in any proposals around the ICS um, certainly not, that's not how we would see it either as a local authority <coughs> or um, or as the acute trust but I don't know whether you want to add anything Matthew um, I, I'd agree um, Paul I, we don't see any major changes in, in the, the, the operational function or um, role uh, of the hospital trust uh, in its license arrangements with CQC uh, or with NHS England at all. They, those will remain in place under, under the new legislation. Um, there will be opportunity for us to look at services with, with community colleagues and, and also uh, commissioning colleagues where there is service duplication uh, and opportunities to provide um, improved services for, for the local community, aligning back to, to what Julie's just spoken about around the public health plan. Dr. Cowan. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the paper, Graham. Um, I, I suppose, I, I mean, I've, I've read the paper and I'm happy with how things are progressing, except, and I'm just going to pick on something Matthew said, and he said, working with clinical colleagues. And I think that's really, really crucial. So I know this is very much in an evolutionary process and that we haven't got everything right yet. I, but you referenced the Tr Thriving Places document, and there have been lots of documents, and I think the Thriving Places document is really, really good. But there's another one which is about um, uh, guidance on effective clinical and care professional leadership across ICSs and into place. And that's about strengthening and work, building on uh, cl strong clinical leadership within places and across the ICS, and, and not just doctor and nurse clinical engagement, we're talking the wider MDT and the allied healthcare professionals, but I've yet to see how that is factored into the governance of how we're developing a place. And my fear um, is that we will continue to work on at a management level, <coughs> but without engaging with uh, clinicians. Now, I know that uh, um, there is a, a Dr. Wyatt sits on the uh, the development group, um, but I haven't seen any governance structures that brings in senior clinical leadership um, as referenced in, in the um, effective clinical and care professional leadership. And so I'm just wondering, is that something that's going to happen at a future stage, but is that not closing the door after the whole horse is bolted? So I just ask that, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Cowan. Um, I, I think it's a fair point at this stage, and I think that um, you know that there is a lot more to do in describing how this will all work and how we'll bring in all of those voices. You know, today again, I've said it a few times, like what we heard from the community and voluntary and faith sector about how we can bring them in. I think we we do need need to hear from clinicians as well. One of the areas that um, I, I feel that we absolutely need to focus in on more is the relationship between primary care networks, neighbourhoods and how we bring in the views of those, uh, of those networks into uh, this development. Because what we do at neighbourhood level is absolutely key to the sorts of changes we've talked about earlier on in dealing with health inequality. So it's absolutely clear that um, I think so far um, the, the we've, we've looked much more at Wirral Borough level uh, in, ter in terms of defining place and what that might mean in terms of this legislation and the focus being trying to get that delegation down but clearly um, there's a lot more to do in terms of uh, working out how the networks are going to feed in and how the the whole system will work more effectively 
Can I just come back on that? I, I, I agree, and I think it's great to, to be looking at, uh, at a PCN and at a neighbourhood level, but we don't want to do that to, and, and, and exclude Dr Stevenson and colleagues at the hospital and Dr Cross at the Community Trust and Dr Allen in CWP because when we talk about clinical leadership, it's, it's across our whole system and it's bringing everybody together. So there's been an awful lot of focus on primary care networks and PCN clinical directors. And I mean, if they were to do everything that people point to them in meetings to do, they wouldn't, there, there isn't enough hours in the week, never mind in a day, to do everything that people say, well, we'll just get the PCN CDs to do that. And these are people who haven't really been in clinical leadership roles before, who put their hand up to do one session a week to, you know, steer their 30,000 population, and all of a sudden they're thrust into this. So I think when we're talking about clinical leadership, it's bringing our system clinical leaders, not just one element of it. So... I'm sorry if I'm saying something that you've already thought of, but I think it's really important at this stage, before we get to March and go, oh, well, what about the clinical leaders? Where are they? Is that okay? Again, thank you, Dr. Karen. I think the primary care network quote was really to talk about another area that um, has, has not had the focus as yet. And I completely understand that that's different than involving clinical leaders across the system. I think. I was making the linkage between clinical leaders, and of course that includes, as, as you mentioned, um, allied health professionals, social workers, and all of those people as well. But I think I was uh, associating that alongside the, vol the community voluntary and faith sector and other views from, from people with experience of services. So I think building that network and understand how that's gonna work is really important. I mean, there are clearly as, as well some key health improvement pathway pieces of work that need to continue. So the Healthy Will programme that, uh, that we have at the moment is very much about those health improvements and the pathways and making sure that we um, get the best from that range of services. And clearly within the uh, structure we're talking about, provider collaboration, really taking forward those and, and making sure that we continue to have that health improvement right across the sector. And clinicians will be absolutely at the core of that type of work as well. Matthew. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, and um, Dr. Cowan, I, I think that's a really good challenge uh, that, that you put to us, um, and that's something I, I would suggest that, that, that the um, ICP delivery group picks up. Um, I, I think the governance arrangements are still very, if at place, is still in development. Um, but, but you're right, we need to build on some of the work that those clinical advisory groups that were established during, during the COVID period and some of those other groups had, had started to develop and, and how they feed in at, at provider collaborative level, but also at place partnership level. So I'll make sure that we take that away and include that as we develop over the coming months. Okay. Thank you all for your, your comments on that. Um, I mean, I think it's also important that I think we get very tied up with talking about health partners in the local authority as if they're the only people who are going to be part of this partnership and that's not the case. We've heard today lots about our community voluntary and faith sector and how vital it is that they're a part of it but we have other people who are part of it too, our partners in education, um, you know, our partners certainly in police and Merseyside Fire and Rescue. I mean, we, our overarching uh, purpose in this board is for people to live happy, safe and healthy lives in Wirral. Um, we say that everyone can live happy, safe and healthy lives. Um, we've all got different parts of that, that role and certainly one of the things that I'd really like to come um, to this committee um, is something around Project Adder. Um, I had a pre was a present at a, a presentation on that several weeks ago and it was I was amazed at the teamwork and the working together that you actually see in that project and how effective that is um, in terms of its impact um, on drug related deaths um, and drug related crimes. So I think that's certainly something that's of value to all of us and an absolutely key part of, of any integrated um, 
care partnership that, that's developed. So I do hope um, that that is something that we're able to bring um, to a future meeting of this committee. Um, so in the meantime, I'm happy to move those recommendations. Um, we have a second for that. Anyway, Simon, thank you. Right, that brings us to the Section 75 Agreement Directoral Report on pool funds, yeah? Thank you, Chair. So the Health and Wellbeing Board has a, a, a role in relation to uh, agreeing how the Better Care Fund is used uh, to support integrated health and care across the borough. Um, the, the services that are included in the Better Care Fund are part of our pooled funds, and that's why I've brought the whole pooled fund here. Um, Better Care Fund services are particularly uh, useful in terms of how uh, we support people um, to um, become independent after they've had a period of illness in hospital or where um, there, there is a requirement for additional therapeutic input and those types of things. So quite a significant area, really. Uh, the Section 75 overall um, is um, going to the Adult Social Care and Public Health Committee um, and the reason it goes there really is um, for the council's contribution to the pool to be signed off. So um, the paper isn't here today uh, specifically for sign off as a whole, but it is um, in, in order that the Health and Wellbeing Board understands how those pooled funds sit together, what's included, and um, uh, to provide that clarity really of, of, of how we're working with those as, as a, a set of uh, integrated commissioners. So for this financial period, for 21-22, the pooled fund is proposed at £235 million, and that's set out in Appendix 1 of the report. Um, and it also includes reference to the uh, previous year's pool, 2020-21, uh, um, primarily because the principles of, of the pool and the, the um, focus really remain primarily unchanged. I think uh, it's useful to consider, well, what sorts of things are, do, are these pooled funds uh, used for? And uh, there, are, there are a number of elements in there. But for the Better Care Fund, I think one of the most important things, as I mentioned, really, is, is enabling that effective hospital discharge. And one of the most recent commissions is that we've commissioned three ward areas at uh, Clutterbridge um, site, uh, Iris, Bluebell, and um, another ward whose, whose name I can't remember off the top of my head. But in essence, they're uh, discharged to assess services. And uh, the pooled fund has been used to enable the transfer across from using uh, independent sector care homes in quite a fragmented way across the borough to being able to commission those NHS run services that uh, will provide really effective and positive uh, reablement for the people of our borough. But of course the pooled fund itself is much broader, it includes a very wide range of locally commissioned services um, that we take forward into the new ICS arrangements and again I think that's important because there's a lot of community services, primary care, the prescribing budget, there's a whole range of things in this, in this pool uh, in terms of going forward so that again um, quite importantly we're looking for that delegation to carry forward. Uh, indications so far are that um, pooled fund arrangements that are in place during this financial year will be carried forward in a steady state manner for 2022 to 23. So that gives us some assurance that um, the system uh, would um, be able to uh, provide that kind of security that uh, we wouldn't see a massive change in those community-based services uh, during the first year of the new NHS arrangements. Thank you, Chair. Any questions for Graham on that? No, we're all happy with that. What's not to like about 235 million? Um, okay, and we're so we're being asked to um, to note the proposals. Um, all the way through, and that will, as Graham said, go to um, 
the Adult Social Care and Public Health Committee for uh, sign-off as part of the budget. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm happy to um, propose that, to have a second of that. Second of that. Second of that. Thank you. Right. And that brings us to the work program, um, which is you again. I'll try it now. You can make it come on. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, the purpose of this report is to ensure that uh, members of the board have the opportunity to contribute to the delivery of the board's annual work programme. Um, I would draw attention to the items already on the work programme and invite any comments that any members of the board may have. Anything that anybody... Um, wants to add to this or remove from this? Councillor Gilchrist. Thank you, Joe. I think at the end of the July meeting, I started a discussion which involved Dr. Cowan about the restoration and development of NHS services after COVID-19. It's mentioned on page 167. And I wondered when we might have a picture of how our services are recovering and building back after all that we've been through over the last year or so, um, particularly perhaps some figures on how waiting periods for certain operations or procedures are shaping up in Wirral as everyone really tries hard to, to catch up, but catching up could be um, some considerable time in some fields, on the other hand progress in some uh, work might be much quicker. So having a picture of how us our colleagues in the health service are responding and doing all they can to help retain or return to something like we had before the pandemic would be very helpful. So I'm just wondering if we have a, a date at which we might get to that before us. Thanks, Councillor Gilchrist. It is there on the future items, so maybe we can get that into um, maybe the committee after next, the board after next. Yeah, I'm more than happy to uh, to take uh, something to maybe the, well the next committee looks quite full maybe the one after that um, but just to um, assure um, Councillor Gilchrist that um, rest restoration of elective surgery is is a, uh, an absolute priority um, not only in Wirral but across the NHS and I applaud our colleagues uh, across our own system here in Wirral for the work that's been done on restora restoring uh, services to as near to normal, or whatever we want to describe as normal, but as near to uh, pre-pandemic levels as possible. And, and certainly um, elective surgery is, is being undertaken uh, across all surgical specialties, um, and uh, our rates are improving. Um, and certainly our um, numbers around um, elective surgery and uh, around particularly around cancer care are um, improving rapidly and, and the trajectory is certainly to have us uh, ahead of pre-pandemic levels uh, as soon as possible. Um, that with, notwithstanding, however, the pressures that we are seeing across our system and the, um, the pressures on um, I won't talk about general practice because I have a conflict there, but certainly our emergency services, the uh, emergency department, walk-in centres and Northwest Ambulance. So paralleling to that, we are, I think I would uh, certainly say that our elective recovery is, is certainly uh, progressing with, with great speed. However, we do have the impact of the, uh, the, the strain uh, on the emergency services and the knock-on effect that that may have on elective surgery. But it's something that's being looked at on a twice, three times daily basis. Matthew? Yeah, I'd, um, I'd echo that, Dr Cowan. Um, uh, we, we certainly have uh, an elective recovery program in place um, that, that includes weekend working uh, where possible for our consultant uh, and specialist teams uh, to, to get through any um, elective backlog that, that, that is eventuated following the, the pandemic response. 
Uh, in addition to that, we've, we've really tried to push and utilise Clatterbridge Hospital um, as our cold elective site, uh, increasing the usage of that site uh, and the establishment of POCU unit, which is a, a step down HDU unit to allow more complex surgery out on that site and, and protect the elective capacity. Uh, I think the challenge, as Dr Cowan out alluded to, is, is the real increase um, in ambulance attendances and uh, attendances in general uh, across the emergency department at Arrow Park. Uh, and across the walk-in centres, um, both at Arrow Park and, and um, across Wirral. We're seeing large numbers of attendances across August and September, um, and that, that eventuates onto a large proportion of emissions as well, um, uh, um, which impacts potentially on elective surgery. So, yeah, happy to provide uh, further detail on that at future meetings, maybe in collaboration with, the, with CCG colleagues. Thanks, Wally. If nobody else has anything they want to add to the work program, I would just like to, well, okay. Just, I was just going to raise the question of children and young people being, but I'm sure that's what Simone's about to do. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I was going to suggest for the work program that we would like to add a report around early years looking at how we are co-working with our health colleagues across that sector. Uh, and I'm sure we would, we would also like to look at uh, some report coming back from our young people with special educational needs at, as, as we go forward as well. Yeah, I think from our conversation, um, we talked about bringing some of our young people who wanted to come to talk to the board about what it's like to grow up as a young person with a disability. Um, Yes, thank you, Chair. That I have raised that with our young people and, and the voice, and they are very keen to put something on. They have been a little bit occupied because we've had an inspection or having an inspection this week, but as soon as that's completed, they, are, they were quite delighted to be given the offer to, to come and put something together. Uh, the areas that they would like to talk about are very much areas that affect health as much as um, social care or council services. So again, fetching it to this forum and and for them to be able to, to, to say how they are managing um, with those services, both now and you know, with the impact of COVID, I think they would very much welcome that. Certainly, that should give us all something to learn from, hopefully. We all talk about how important it is to hear about people with lived experience. Let's try it. Um, so we'll, we'll work on getting that into the work programme as soon as we can, Simone. Thank you. Nobody's got anything else they want to add to that? Other than that, those, issues, those um, opportunities to bring our young people um, to talk to us other than that? No. That's fine, in which case we're... Um, with that addition, then, uh, we'll move those recommendations. Second, Simone, thank you. And that, I believe, members, brings us to the end of the meeting. Um, so thank you all very much for your attendance. And I hope that you found that a valuable and, and useful meeting, despite the appalling weather. I don't know if it's got any better. <laughs>